Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 73, and we're going to discuss conservation of energy. Before we get into the conservation of energy equation, I'd like to talk about the work energy theorem. And basically, the work energy theorem, W equals delta Ke, or wake, says that the work done on an object is the amount of kinetic energy that we'll gain. So if I were to throw a baseball, the work it takes for me to move my arm back and forward and then release the ball will be the kinetic energy that it gains. Now, if there's no friction involved, the formula is just simply W equals the change in kinetic energy. If friction's involved, though, we're going to have to add the friction, the work done by friction. So that would be W equals delta Ke plus the work of friction. I did extra work, and I didn't get the same output. So friction is the reason that the work I do would mean that the kinetic energy is not equal. So I have to add it to the right side of the equation so that the work I do still equals the, the, the total work of the system. And basically, this is our basis for conservation of energy. The question students have is whether or not this is a new concept. And the reality is the work energy theorem is merely a combination of the work equation and equation 5 from the kinematics section. So like I said before, a lot of what we're doing now is concepts that are repeated, but just looking at different variables and different point of views. We're describing why things are moving. And energy is a reason, and momentum is a reason, and work and power are reasons, and so are forces. So this is just another tool that we have in order to break those difficult and complex problems up into smaller, more manageable pieces. The right tool for the job is going to make the job easier. So in some cases, energy is going to be the tool we need to solve a certain problem. In other cases, it will be momentum or impulse or maybe even forces. But it's a, a matter of having as many tools as are at our disposal as, as possible to make our jobs easier. Anyone who's ever done work around the house, um, you know, construction work, things like that, you know that having the right job for the tool, right tool for the job, makes the job a lot easier. So having the right tool is important, and this is just the way I look at it. We have another tool at our disposal in order to solve new problems. So the kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared final minus one half mv squared initial, the change, is no different than combining work equals mad, and Vf squared minus Vi squared equals 2AD. The combination of, of those two equations gets us this single equation. And as we learned earlier, if you can solve something in one step, you have less chance to make a mistake. So it's good to have this at our disposal. Now, strictly speaking, conservation of energy is very similar to conservation of momentum. In fact, conservation of momentum said that in a closed system, the total momentum is constant. The momenta is ju are just exchanged between the two objects in a collision. Well, the same thing applies with energy. In a closed system, the total energy is constant. But instead of looking at multiple objects, we look at a single object. And the object can have different types of energy. In fact, it can have kinetic, it can have potential, and the potential can be broken down into either gravitational or elastic. Typically, we see uh, gravitational and kinetic energy combined, but a spring could be involved at the beginning of the problem, giving more energy to the object as it moves throughout the problem. So basically, if we take a snapshot of a problem, we can determine what the kinetic energy is, the potential energy is, or possibly even um, the elastic potential at different points in its path. So the equation I like to call peaky-peaky. Potential energy initial plus kinetic energy initial equals potential energy final plus the kinetic energy final. You can use Fs, or you can use the primes like we did before with the momentum section. But the peaky-peaky equation is going to be very important when we're dealing with energy at different points in objects' path. The combination is typically going to be uh, two terms on each side, although it could be three. But more likely, some of the terms will actually be zero. The object may start or end on the ground, giving the potential energy zero. Or the object may start or end stopped, giving the kinetic energy zero. So certain factors or certain variables within that equation will often simplify out of the equation. 
Now, this is, of course, assuming that we don't have any friction. If friction's involved, we have a different problem. And that's the fact that the initial energy is always going to be greater than the energy at the end because friction stole some energy. In fact, friction did work in order to steal that energy. So what we're going to have to do if we had 10 joules at the beginning and 8 joules at the end is add the extra 2 joules to the right side of the equation. And the way we're going to do that is by adding the work done by friction. So the friction term is always going to be on the right side of the equation in the final term. And it allows us to still abide by the conservation of energy law. The fact that the energy before and after um, are the same, although friction was used up some of it. So the 10 joules on the left will still equal 10 joules on the right, even though friction reared its ugly head in this case. But if we have peaky peaky, we might have peaky peaky w, peaky peak oov, which doesn't sound as good. So hopefully we do more problems that don't deal with friction so we don't have to worry about adding that w at the right side of the final terms. Now that being said, um, the equation looks ominous, but the importance is that many of the terms cancel out and simplify. But if you have kinetic energy, you're going to replace 1 half mv squared for that. Potential energy will often be mgh, and sometimes it will be 1 half kx squared. Another issue that comes up with conservation of energy is the fact that you may not be given the mass in a problem. Well, don't worry, because if the mass is in the kinetic energy term and the potential energy due to gravity term, and it stays constant throughout the problem, there's a good chance that the mass won't matter in the problem. In fact, the mass is often canceled out when we're dealing with ideal situations. It's only when friction's involved that mass is going to really matter. But in normal problems, if you don't know the mass, don't freak out. It's going to be okay. Chances are it'll just cancel out. Now, that being said, we, um, of course, have different types of collisions, and we talked about this when we dealt with momentum. But I just want to reiterate again that we could have elastic or inelastic collisions. And in an inelastic collision, you have objects typically stick together and energy is lost. But in elastic collision, the kinetic energy is going to be conserved. So if you have collisions and you're doing a problem that is a little more complex, maybe it has multiple unknowns, chances are you can use the conservation of momentum in conjunction with conservation of energy to solve for possibly two unknowns. So just be aware in problems that may state elastic or inelastic. If it's inelastic, there's friction involved, and we're going to have a W on the right side of the terms. But if it's elastic, we may have a situation where kinetic energy is conserved, and we could actually solve for more variables than we thought we could originally. Typically, those are honors or AP style problems, but we can definitely be faced with them um, on a whim in class, uh, and we should be able to handle those multi multivariable problems because we've done them in the past already. Now, as far as conservation of, of energy goes, that is the content involved. I think it's the more difficult part to put into practice. So what I'd like to do is start looking at practice problems from here on out. For most of this chapter, we've been discussing conservation of energy. But in many of the cases, the potential energy something had at the beginning turns into the kinetic energy at the end. And I just want to show you how those two equations are related. We have potential energy, which is mgh, and we have kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared. And right away, since it's the same object involved, the mass is canceled. Now, if I bring this two over, or the half over, it becomes 2gh equals v squared. Now, this is our equation based on energy. But remember, we had an equation before, which is vf squared minus vi squared equals 2ad. Well, in all of these problems, as we have an object at the maximum height, the initial velocity is 0. So this whole term disappears. And we're left with vf squared equals 2ad. 
And if we look at these two equations, they're really the same thing. Vf is V, because V ends up being Vf. We just don't write it as such. The acceleration is really G. And the distance the object falls is the same as the height. So equation 5 is simplified in this case for any problem where the initial velocity is 0 and allows us to compare maximum potential energy to maximum kinetic energy. But remember, there's not always going to be a case where an object's always at rest. And there's not always a case where the object will gain all the kinetic energy. So this is a very simplistic way of comparing the two equations. But this fifth equation, when we get rid of VI, is really the case where the potential energy at the max turns into kinetic energy max at the end of the problem. So we've been dealing with energy the entire course. We just didn't call it such. So now we're realizing that the tools we have are useful in different situations, but some of them are actually really the same thing, just with different terms. Remember, this was an A instead of a G, and we use them in different situations. All right, we're going to lift a 2-kilogram textbook up into the air, and we're going to figure out how much potential energy it gains. So in this case, we have a textbook that's 2 kilograms, and we're going to lift at a height of 1.75 meters, and we'll find the potential energy, which is MGH. But let's just jump to a more common question, which is how fast does it hit the ground? Well, remember, at the top we have potential, and at the bottom we have kinetic. So we could just set up the equation, potential energy equals the kinetic energy. MGH equals 1 half MV squared. Masses are irrelevant. 9.8 meters per second squared. 1.75 meters equals 1 half V squared. So 9.8 times 1.75 divided by a half square root, and it's 5.86 meters per second. Now this is a speed, so it's positive. But if we were talking about a velocity, we know it would be down, so negative. Now you can try to solve this the old school way using Vf squared minus Vi squared equals 2AD. And you should come up with the same answer. For this next one, what we're going to do is determine how fast a penny is going to move if I flick it with my finger with 2 newton force, and while I'm in contact with it, it moves 0 0.05 meters. Now, if we look at this, this is a force and a distance. So that's the work we have to do. The force is 2 newtons times 0.05, so the work I do is 0 0.1 joules. All of that work will go into turning the penny into kinetic energy, so causing it to move. So kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, 0 0.1 joules equals 1 half, now 2.5 grams is 0 0.00 to 5 kilograms, it's three places to the left, v squared. So 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.0025, take the square root, and I will flick that penny so that it gains a speed of 8.9 meters per second. Quite fast.